Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar series, Thriving in Substance Use Disorders, Service Delivery in the Post-COVID Era. Thank you very much to all of you for being here today. My name is Andrea Hebler and I will be your facilitator during this session. Uh, before we start, I wanted to remind all of you that this session is being recorded for later distribution. However, the information that you see on the chat will not appear on their recording. Um, if you're interested in closed captioning for this session, you may go to the bottom part of your Zoom menu and go to the captioning button, and that way you can obtain the, the, the captioning, I'm sorry. Um, today, uh, before anything, I want to say that this webinar has been an effort of the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementary and CSTAT and the Texas Mental Health Commission with the intention of exploring and analyzing the intersection between substance use disorders and COVID-19. So that means that during the first, the next eight sessions, actually, we're going to be training on mitigating, managing, communicating, everything related to COVID-19, but specifically that intersection between substance use disorders, behavioral health, and COVID-19. So this is going to be a great uh, reunion of experts and speakers from uh, substance use disorders, from the substance use disorders field, and from the uh, immunology and uh, other areas of the medical field. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, combination of specialists talking about COVID-19 and substance use disorders. So before we start, I wanted to introduce our speaker is Dr. Barbara Taylor. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for being with us today. It's such a pleasure to see you opening our eight-part webinar series. Dr. Taylor, among other things, she is an associate professor of infectious diseases at UT Health San Antonio. She is also the assistant dean for the MPH program here at UT Health San Antonio as well. But more than anything, Dr. Taylor took a very important role during the COVID-19 pandemic here in the city of San Antonio. She was part of um, an initiative led by Major Ron Nuremberg on how to open the city after COVID-19. That's quite an achievement to be part of that team and have to decide uh, for you to have to take part on how to reopen safely a city, meaning schools, businesses, parks, after a pandemic. Dr. Taylor, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to introduce yourself briefly and start your presentation. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And I'm really thrilled to be here. This is such an important series and I'm very excited to be um, kicking it off. Is it okay if I start sharing my screen? Oh yes, of course. All right, so I think I'm going to start sharing my screen and you all will be able to tell me if you can see it. And hopefully now you can see the presenter view. Yes, we see the presenter view, thank Perfect. you. Okay, well, so, um, like was said, my name is Barbara Taylor. I am really looking forward to this talk today. And I was asked to speak about the triple threat of RSV, COVID, and influenza, and where we are going with therapeutics and treatment and prevention of these things, and then also the intersection of these viral illnesses with substance use disorder and other issues. So these are my disclosures. The one thing I think, there are a couple of things that I think it's important to say at this point. One is that I always try to use generic names in my talks, but in this case, the vaccines, even when the CDC and the FDA and all of these government bodies are uh, speaking about them are known by their brand names. So I will be using brand names. Uh, the generic names are numbers and nobody remembers them. So I will be using some brand names, especially to describe the vaccines. And the other thing that you all should know about me is that I'm really passionate about prevention and vaccines. I have the honor of being the principal investigator of the COVID-19 Prevention Network site here at UT Health San Antonio. That's an international NIH funded network that has studied, started from 
the very beginning and sort of 2020, 2021 to study different potential COVID vaccines. And I was the head of the local Novavax trial here at UT Health San Antonio and University Health. So I will be talking about some uh, vaccines that I have played a role in developing. And the other disclosure, which I think it's important to say, is that I'm about to talk about some issues that are challenging. Um, I know the COVID pandemic was challenging for many of us, and we've all lived through that. And I'm going to talk about that and the impact on marginalized populations. I have recognized, especially in this space, I am not an expert on substance use. And so I really look forward to the questions and dialogue about that. And also I come from multiple positions of privilege. So I welcome other perspectives and opinions in this space where there are so many experts. So with all that said, we're gonna talk about current trends in RSV, COVID and flu and how we monitor them. Because I think one important thing is that we are all good consumers of data and know where to get reliable data about where we are with all of these infections in our community. We're gonna review prevention and treatment of all three viruses. And then we're gonna talk about health disparities and equity issues and challenges in addressing these pandemics. So we're starting with RSV. This is probably the one that we uh, talk about at least in the general population least. So just as a reminder of what RSV is. So RSV is respiratory syncytial virus. We often think of RSV in relation to children. So it's incredibly common in children. By the time that kids are three, there almost everybody has had a case of RSV. It is, however, increasingly, really increasingly over the last 15 years, recognized as a pathogen in older adults and in anyone who is immunocompromised. So it causes a viral respiratory syndrome. Everything I'm going to talk about today causes viral respiratory syndrome. So that's a that's a given. It's mostly upper respiratory, so it sort of looks like a common cold, but we very much worry when it becomes lower respiratory. It can cause pneumonia, it can cause apnea, prolonged illness in kids, especially if you get it before 12 months, they can have permanent lung damage. And it is estimated that one to 3% of infants under 12 months of age in the United States are hospitalized from RSV every year. So I'm going to say that again. That means that one to three percent of babies under a year are hospitalized because of RSV. So it has a huge impact nationally. And as you can see, I think you can see my pointer. As you can see, if you look at national trends, so the little dates are very, very tiny here, but I'm sorry, that's the CDC, not me. And uh, you can tell that it's winter is when we get RSV. So this is last winter, 2022, 2023, and this is this winter. And so we can see these very predictable upticks of RSV in the winter, both nationally and in the state of Texas. And we do tend to, you'll notice that we see, a, we've been seeing a little bit more uh, lately, but it has come down. And this is, these data are the most recent we have available, which is the end of uh, uh, sort of mid-January. Um, and so it is easy to track RSV in our communities. It's particularly easy because we know it always comes with winter. And our pediatrics colleagues, I'm not a pediatrician, kids are terrifying. Um, always know when RSV season hits. I actually saw my first case of RSV in the hospital <clears throat> in San Antonio over the summer, actually in August uh, in an adult. So that's RSV and where you can go for RSV data. And generally, sorry, the one other thing I meant to point out was that we track RSV mostly by tests. There are great antigen tests. There are also PCR tests. Um, but also, if you see upticks in pediatric ER visits for upper respiratory infections in, say, October, November, very often that is RSV. So COVID, we all have had a crash course in how to know what it, COVID is happening, what is happening with COVID in our community over the last four years. And the most up-to-date data these days are published by the CDC on their national maps. And they have they have all sorts of dashboards that you can look at. You, I encourage you to look at the trackers. Um, they have graphs, they have maps. I like the maps because I like to see what's going on in the entire country. And the, 
one of the things that the CDC uses to track severity of COVID in our community is a metric that's new hospital admissions for every 100,000 hospital admissions. So this is interesting. And for those of you, so you can see South Texas, not a ton of COVID right this minute. In fact, Bear County, which is right here, uh, is green with not that many admissions. And I can tell you that firsthand. We haven't had a lot of COVID admissions this season, which is very welcomed for those of us who sort of lived in the hospital in 2021. And the other thing to think about, though, is this is very much a what we call a lagging indicator. So if COVID is going up in a community, and a lot of people are getting COVID, one of the challenges is we are testing a lot less for COVID. So we can't really use COVID positive tests at this point to track COVID in our community. Using hospitalizations is a lagging indicator because if a bunch of people get COVID, hopefully most of them are not going to be hospitalized. And the folks that are gonna get hospitalized are gonna get hospitalized usually a week or two weeks or even more into their infection. So you can have a lot of COVID in your community before your hospital admissions go up. So what do we do about that? The other thing is COVID is um, still very important. Like even though Bear County is green and we, we are, definitely in a better place than we were previously, it's important to recognize that in this same week where most of the country, most of the counties in the country are green, there were still 13,000 patients hospitalized for COVID-19, which is more than were hospitalized for influenza in that same week. And one in 25 U.S. deaths were due to COVID. So yes, we are in the third year of our pandemic. Yes, we have a lot more tools, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, to deal with COVID, but it is still a threat to all of our health, unfortunately. But how do we deal with the fact that it would be better to know when COVID is rising before or as it is rising rather than two to three weeks after it rises when people start showing up in the hospital? So one of the interesting things that we can do is survey wastewater. And so this has been done for decades for other illnesses. There's been wastewater surveillance for polio virus for quite some time, and that's been really instrumental in our polio elimination efforts. So the general concept, it is exactly what it sounds like. They check the poop. They go to different sites around the country that are often they are wastewater treatment sites. Currently in Texas, there are 14 sites reporting. There are a couple of sites in actually Bear County, for those of y'all who are in San Antonio that have just come online. And they look to see how much COVID is in the wastewater because when you have COVID, you pee COVID or you poop COVID into the system. And I'm sorry, it's, you know, it's lunchtime, I apologize. But this is a great way to track it because it doesn't require people to go in and get a test. It doesn't take three weeks for them to be hospitalized for it to show up on this dashboard, you can see it early on. So if COVID starts to surge in a community, we see the levels in the wastewater go up immediately. And so what does this look like? You can see, so last winter we had COVID and more COVID. We, some of y'all may remember, we had a bump over the summer in COVID cases. You see that also in the wastewater viral activity level. And then you see our winter surge, which is, Hopefully the, the gray is sort of um, the most recent week's reporting data, which is incomplete, but we are hoping that we are on the other edge of the curve for our winter COVID season. So this can be a helpful way of tracking COVID in real time and giving us information that might actually affect how we move in the world. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So now let's talk about influenza. This map does not look as nice as the COVID map that I just showed you. And you can tell that Texas is high currently as far as influenza trends. These are also unfortunately really only going up. So we are seeing a lot of influenza right now. I, uh, I actually personally know several people with influenza right this moment. Um, so this is when I remind you that it's not too late to get your flu shot. Um, we are, you know, 
as you can see, influenza in the U.S. right now is pretty widespread, uh, but Texas and the U.S. South is uh, being hardest hit. So many healthcare workers are required to get the flu shot every year. That is a really important um, way that we protect our patients and our community. So I just encourage everybody to consider getting a flu shot. I'll show you also these maps, which shows what happened to influenza during COVID? Because there are, I think there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of question about whether or not the precautions that we took during COVID impacted transmission. And there's a lot of question about mask wearing and social distancing and all of the things that we did. And I think in some ways, these, if we look at data from 2020 and 2021, um, we have our answer. So this is the same week in three years running. In November of 2020, many of the public health mitigation risks, uh, measures for COVID were in place. Um, people were still masking, there was social distancing, many places had schools closed still, and there was very, very little COVID, very little influenza. In November of 2021, there was still not that much influenza. But by 2022, we were back with influenza. And it's interesting, I don't, I'm don't. i not showing you the graphs for RSV, but it's actually the same. So we literally had a season in 2020 and a little bit in 2021 where people weren't dying of flu and RSV. And in fact, there's some estimates of the number of kids' lives saved because there weren't RSV infections that are really impressive. I am not saying that we should go back to 2020, just to be very clear. But if people ask you if masks work or if social distancing work, I think this is one of the answers. And then there's always the question of, can you get these things at the same time? And I still remember, I don't know if any of you all remember the time when uh, flurona was a term that was taken up by uh, the media about people who were getting COVID and influenza at the same time. So I've created a new term, which is Fleurzvona, which would be flu, RSV, and COVID all the way back. I do not encourage people to use this term. Um, but it is important to recognize that you can get more than one viral infection at the same time, unfortunately. The fact that you have COVID doesn't really protect you against getting flu or RSV at the same time. We have not a ton of data on this because testing for this is really relatively new. We have combined respiratory PCR panels now that we use a lot in the hospital that test for an array of respiratory pathogens. So if someone comes in with a respiratory infection, we can quickly test them for COVID and flu and RSV all at the same time. A recent review, that's this one down here, uh, used 21 studies to see the co-infection rates of people with COVID and how many of them also had influenza. And the estimate was 16%, but you can see the range was massive from basically no co-infection to 58% of people were co-infected with flu and COVID. And so I think it is important to recognize when there's a range that wide, it means we don't know enough and we need more information and more data. There is also a pediatric study that came out uh, just a few months ago on co-infection with RSV or flu and COVID uh, in kids with COVID. This is a single site, but they had thousands of children. And of the kids with COVID, 22%, 2.2%, sorry, had RSV and 4.9% had flu. So not a lot of co-infection, but still enough. Why do we worry about this? Because we know that co-infection with COVID and flu is associated with a higher risk of uh, being sent to the intensive care unit and a higher risk of being put on a ventilator. There are really limited data for RSV, so I'm basically not gonna quote you any of those. So coming to the end of our, what is happening with RSV, COVID and flu right now, hopefully I've given you some websites, they're all in the slides, of where to look for up-to-date data, I would think about leading versus lagging indicators and recognize that if we're not testing for things, we don't see them, which is why in some ways wastewater surveillance is very helpful because we don't nobody has to test to get that information. I would encourage you to pay attention to trends in your region 
And remember that the public health prevention measures can make a difference. And so since I'm speaking to a lot of substance use disorder experts, I will say that often I find myself talking to my patients and my friends and my family about taking a harm reduction approach when it comes to this. So if you know that there's a lot of COVID in your community and you have a reason to not wanna get COVID, and the reasons can be anything from, I have an immunocompromising condition to, I am going to Alaska next week. That's not me personally, but that is a reason that I have heard. You can take extra precautions. You can wear a mask. You can, if you're getting a bunch of people together, you can ask them to antigen test for COVID ahead of time. So the measures can make a difference and we can all take a harm reduction approach as to how we approach them in our community. And then really beware of winter. Even in places like Texas, which don't really have a winter, we have a little bit of a winter, um, people gathering, people coming together leads to more RSV and flu. COVID so far, and interestingly, despite the fact that it is a coronavirus, which is usually very susceptible to differences in hot and cold weather, SARS-CoV-2 seems to not be that susceptible to variation. And so it is... Um, always around and tends to respond more to things like people moving around for summer vacation, people gathering, the start of school. So we'll see COVID probably at other times other than just winter. So I am going to pause really quickly to finish the current trends section of the talk and see if anyone has any questions that could be answered. So Yes. So Anna Eisenberg asks a great question, which is you've had people go in and they get tested for COVID, flu, and strep, but not for RSV. So this is a great question, and it really depends on where you're getting tested So and also what tests we have available. So there are some times when we have the whole respiratory panel available and sometimes we don't. Um, traditionally, RSV testing has been reserved for kids, and there is a rapid RSV test that you can use for kids. But the handy dandy tests that we have for COVID don't exist uh, as much for other, for RSV or flu. And so if you're an adult, you're much less likely to get tested for RSV unless you're hospitalized. If you're a kid, you are. So that's sort of how it goes. So now we're going to move on to prevention, and I already said that there is um, there is a lot of prevention available. And the very exciting thing is that if you look at this uh, little thing of pictures of various shots I've put on here, um, one, two, three, four, five of the six were all developed in the last five years, which is really incredible. So. The, the advances that have been made, and I just want to give a sort of shout out to science here. If you all haven't heard the story of how mRNA vaccines came to be, it is really a story of persistence of a few people in believing in an idea and being told they were wrong for many decades and then, and then actually having it work. And it is an amazing uh, story. And Catelyn Carrico is, I think, a hero in science and a great model for women in science, for those of you who are interested in that. But let's talk about these uh, individually. So um, let's talk about RSV. These are the literally newest kids on the block. And the interesting thing is that the RSV vaccine development story and the COVID vaccine development stories overlap because all of the research and the preliminary data and the phase one trials and everything had been done for the R these two RSV vaccines that are here and several others prior to the COVID pandemic. And they were just getting ready to go into phase three trials and test these RSV vaccine candidates when COVID happened. And what they did was they took what they knew and the RSV platforms and just immediately pivoted to make COVID vaccines. And so then what happened was once we had COVID vaccines, two years in, they could finally go back and do the RSV vaccine trials. And so now we have a Rexv and a Brisvo. So these are different vaccines. Um, a Rexv is a protein-based va vaccine that has an adjuvant. This is the one that is only approved so far for 60 people who are 60 years of age or older after consultation with a provider. Now, that's what it says. I will say that my parents uh, 
did not even consult with me and just went to CVS and got their RSV vaccines, which was fine with me, but they did not require consultation with a provider to get their vaccines. Um, and the efficacy is really amazing. It's 82.6% to prevent the lower respiratory tract illness that we worry about so much with RSV. A BRISVO is interesting because it is approved for adults 60 years of age or older after consultation with a provider, but also for people who are between 32 and 36 weeks of pregnancy, important note, not to protect the pregnant person, but to protect the baby that is about to be born. So the interesting thing about this is, this is a vaccine that is taken by a person to protect a different person. And we all, many of us do this. You know, one of the reasons that I continue to get COVID boosters, I am not myself at high risk for COVID, especially since I've been vaccinated. Um, I am not risk for severe disease. But one of the reasons I continue to get boosters is because I work with a very immunocompromised population. Similarly, but different, um, this vaccine, pregnant people can get it and it protects their infants and it protects their infants incredibly well. Now, I already told you that one to 3% of kids under 12, under 12 months get hospitalized for RSV every year in the United States. So this protects it at almost 82% at three months and 69% at six months. And so this is really a bit of a revolution in terms of how we can protect young infants in particular from this disease that has a lot of burden. In addition, there is a new monoclonal antibody for RSV. So this is also tricky. This one is given to the babies, ideally at one week after their birth. So it is indicated for all infants and uptake of this has been tricky. It's a monoclonal antibody, so it is expensive, um, but it is available and it really is incredibly effective at reducing, similar to the vaccine that has to be taken by the pregnant person. Um, this delivered directly to the infant is also incredibly effective at reducing the risk of lower respiratory tract illness. That's what LRTI is from RSV. And so you give it to babies, ideally within a week of their birth. And then if you are a kid at risk of severe disease in your second year of life, so coming onto your second flu season or RSV season, sorry, often they are overlapping. So they're basically the same. And you are immunocompromised or you have pre-existing lung conditions, or you are American Indian or Alas Alaskan native community members, you should get a second dose of this. And it also reduces risk of severe disease. Everyone always asks, why is there a, an ethnic group in the indication? And it is because of the incredibly high rates of RSV and severe RSV and death that we see, unfortunately, in American Indian and Alaska Native populations from this uh, virus. Prevention for COVID. I feel like everybody knows this, but I'm just gonna say there are currently three options for updated COVID vaccines. There's um, the Moderna vaccine, there's a Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and then there's the Novavax vaccine. The current CDC guidance is that everybody who is five years or older should receive one dose of one of these updated COVID vaccines. And for those of you who don't track it as much as some of us do, these are the ones that came avail became available in September or October of last year, so just this fall. And they are specifically targeted to the more recent, but not absolutely recent, lineage of the Omicron variant, so the XBB lineage of the Omicron variant. If you're unvaccinated, there's a slightly different strategy, which I've shown here, especially if you are a kid. And the interesting thing is data just came out literally this week, so I couldn't put it in the slide, um, I, actually two days ago, on the efficacy of the new boosters. And they do very well for prevention. They're actually even better at preventing hospitalizations and severe disease. And for those of you who track COVID lineages, we've transitioned from the XBB Omicron variant to a new uh, variant of Omicron called, called JN1. That is a slightly different variant. 
as far as prevention, these boosters are slightly less good against JN1, but still very effective at preventing severe, hospital severe disease or hospitalization. And then finally, there's the flu shot. I feel like the flu shot, this is just one of many, many, many flu shots available. Um, flu shot gets a bad rap because people are like, oh, it's just not that effective. But you know what it's really effective at is preventing people from dying. So vaccinated 18 to 64 year olds were 47% likely to be hospitalized with the flu last season. Over 65 year olds were 28% less likely. We now have data that show that there is a sort of higher dose vaccine, flu vaccine that can be given to people who are over 65 that can lower the risk of hospitalization. And the good news is that currently this flu season, we're seeing A, H1, A, H3, and B Victoria strains in the community. And the current flu vaccine, which was updated actually between the winter season in the Southern Hemisphere and our winter season, uh, very appropriately, has the correct strains to make it an effective vaccine. So I am hopeful that the 2023-2024 season uh, flu vaccine will is an effective one. And I, like I said, there are a lot of flu cases right now in South Texas. So I would encourage you all to get your flu shots and encourage other people to do so. This is just a nice little summary of all the shots that you can get at various age groups. Uh, if you are 65 and older, you win the lottery by being able to get flu, COVID, and RSV. Um, but this comes from GoodRx, and I think it's a helpful sort of just way to remember who gets what shot and why. So thinking about treatment. So RSV, really the answer, the slide is a short slide because we don't have great treatment. Most of our treatment for RSV is supportive care. In older children and adults who get uh, bronchial reactivity, whose you know, lungs start to spasm with RSV disease, who are hospitalized, we can give them glucocorticoids and bronchodilators like nebulizers to try to open up their lungs. If you are hospitalized, my colleagues who work uh, in transplant infectious diseases work a lot with much more complicated regimens like ribavirin and intravenous immunoglobulin. All of these have very varying data. Palivizumab is a monoclonal antibody that we can use for treatment. Um, we are not yet using the monoclonal antibody that's given to the kids for prevention or treatment, but my guess is that there are more data in the future for those efforts. But we don't have great options for treatment of RSV, and this is an active area of research. Speaking of active areas of research, there are lots of studies going on on treatment of COVID. Who do you treat is the main question. And I think the real answer is that there was a recent study published that showed that only 12% of people who should be getting nematrovir ritonavir, which is Paxlovid, um, are getting it. So there is a real underutilization of the medications that we have for COVID that we know prevent um, severe infection and can prevent hospitalization. So the first recommendation is nematrovir ritonavir or Paxlovid. After that, remdesivir is recommended. That has to be given an IV and it's very tricky to deliver this. Other options like malnupiravir, convalescent plasma have less good data to support their use. And unfortunately, the monoclonal antibodies, which worked well for past COVID strains, do not work against the current circulating strains of COVID. I think one of the reasons that Paxlovid is very rarely or not as often as it should be prescribed is because it is complicated in terms of drug-drug interactions. So this is a great interaction checker. You can put things on it. I think especially for those of you who work in mental health, there are drug-drug interactions between the ritonavir component of Paxlovid and a lot of the medications that we use. And so you definitely want to check this. The other thing I would say to remember, because this happens to many people, is that steroids for COVID are incredibly helpful in hospitalized patients but are actually very harmful in outpatients. And so I've seen, we have seen a lot of people get steroids for outpatient COVID and 
that can actually be dangerous. It can lead to a lot more bacterial and fungal infections. Inpatient treatments for COVID, we have a lot of options. Uh, we at UT Health San Antonio are very proud to be part of the very first remdesivir trial, which is very effective. Steroids work if you're inpatient. Um, and then there are many other immunomodulators like baricitamine or tocilizumab that work for inpatient treatment of COVID. This is when you call your ID docs and we come and we help. Um, treating people in inpatient is definitely appropriate. And the real challenges that we see these days with people getting very sick with COVID in the hospital are challenges in people who are either not vaccinated or people who are profoundly immunocompromised. So if you are um, yourself or the loved one of someone who is immunocompromised, I would encourage you to be very cautious. So my reminders for COVID treatment are Think early about complications. So we have all seen terrible complications of COVID, including heart attacks, stroke, kidney failure, worsening of diabetes, neurologic complications. Really consider when you are caring for someone who's had COVID, especially if they've had COVID recently, that they could be developing complications from COVID. And don't let people ignore the fact that, oh, you know, my legs are kind of swollen since I had COVID last week. That is an emergency. Please pay attention. Um, and then really don't forget along, about long COVID. We are involved in the RECOVER trial, which is the lar largest longitudinal study of long COVID in the nation right now. And Long COVID is no joke. I think there is a perception sometimes that long COVID is something that doesn't really exist, but it really does and it causes significant morbidity for many people. The good news, good news came out actually just this month. The more COVID vaccinations you have, the less likely you are to get long COVID. So this is actually very encouraging data. So for flu, we have great data, we have long-standing medications that we have been using for a while that we know about. It is also under-treated though. So outpatient and inpatient treatment is basically the same. And you should definitely treat people who either have progressive illness, so they get the flu and then they're getting worse, or have risk for complications. And for those folks, you start treatment whenever they come to you. If they're not in that category, where they are having progressive illness or are have risk for complications for some reason, the treatment really only works if you do it within the first 48 hours. So that's a limitation of the flu treatment. Most commonly, we give oseltamivir. There's also inhaled zanamivir, which some people like, IV paramivir, which we really only use in the hospital, and then baloxivir is the new kid on the block. Most people are reserving that because we always worry about resistant flu. And this is just as my reminder for you all that flu can occur alongside RSV, COVID, or bacterial infection. And for flu, in addition to the standard risk categories of very young or older, pregnant women are a risk category. And so really encourage your community, family members, friends, clients, patients, if they are thinking about getting pregnant or if they are pregnant, they should really get a flu vaccine. All right, so I'm gonna pause and see if I can look at the chat to see if there are any questions about prevention and treatment of all of these. So is the rapid, Sandra Sanchez asks, is the rapid child test over the counter? I think that's the RSV question. I think, I actually, I'm not a pediatrician, so I don't know the answer to that question. I know that it is available in pediatricians' offices sometimes. Um, but I can try to find the answer to that. And then uh, the other question is, I learned recently that fully vaccinated people with COVID don't test as accurately on antigen COVID tests. So it's not unfortunately just vaccinated folks. So we have seen a change in how we shed COVID virus. And I'm sorry, we're about to get a little bit into the weeds about COVID. Um, but I do think it's important to recognize because this is a real lesson when it comes to how you use antigen tests, either clinically or personally. So at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the highest viral shedding that occurred 
was usually one or two days into your infection. So you did shed some virus before you started to feel ill, but really the first day or so was the biggest, um, the biggest bang for your buck as far as uh, COVID uh, viral shedding, which meant that if you took an antigen test, which tests literally for how much virus is in your nose, early on in your symptoms in day one or day two, it was very likely to pop positive. Now what has happened as we have had more vaccines, our immune systems are getting better at responding to what is now a four-year-old virus rather than a you know one-year-old virus, um, the time of maximum viral shedding has moved. And so now if I get COVID and I start having symptoms today, I will shed more virus three or four days from now. So that's not great because if I get sick today, I'm gonna to take a COVID test today and that antigen test may not be positive. So the thing I want you all to know is one antigen test is just one antigen test. It is not good enough at this point. It has always been indicated to test, take more than one antigen test. If you look on the box, those are the instructions. That's why they come in sets of two. I don't know many people who use them that way, to be very honest. But what I would really encourage you to do is if you have symptoms that seem like COVID and you want to take an antigen test, take the test and then take it again in 48 hours. If you're still ill, take it again because the original sort of early on symptoms may not represent a lot of viral shedding and that makes the tests be false negative. Fortunately, there are less problems with this with the PCR test, but not that many people are getting PCR tests for COVID these days, quite frankly. And so we're really reliant on the antigen tests and they're not as great early on. So I hope that answers your question, but feel free to put more questions in the chats if you like. Um, the question is, is it true that RSV season is over? This is a great question. Thank you so much for asking. If you remember from the chart, we're still way up here with RSV. Over is down here. So it is not over. And I would still recommend people getting um, RSV tests uh, and vaccines uh, through the rest of this month. And then you can probably pause. Uh, RSV always starts to tick up. I mean, you know, never say always, but generally starts to tick up in the fall, usually like September, October. And so then you should get it again in the fall. Is RSV vaccine for pregnant people available at local AGB, CVS, or Walgreens? This is a great question. And I heard that it was available. I know that it is available for folks over 60. And so I would assume that it is also available for pregnant people. Um, so there, let me see if I can try. There is a vaccine.gov website that you can look for vaccine availability generally. It's how I have, I know some folks who really don't want an mRNA vaccine. And so they're looking for the protein uh, based COVID vaccine and you can find places that give that vaccine on, on that website. So I believe that it is available, but I will look at local BIA, even with OB approval. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, that is discouraging. I think the good news, I deemed RSV season is over. Ugh, that's frustrating to me. Um, anyway, I would encourage you to reach out to your OBs and maybe they can write strongly worded letters so that you all can get the RSV vaccine because it is, the reality is if you're pregnant now and you're delivering six months from now, um, your baby is not gonna be born in the middle of an RSV season. So that's encouraging. And what you could do in that case is remember there's a monoclonal antibody that you can give to infants. And so you should do that and that will protect them through the next RSV season. So I think that's a different way to think about it. But that's, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, so we're gonna move on to talking about health disparities equity issues and challenges in addressing these pandemics. And so this is where I remind us all that, you know, we do, a, we have amazing advances in research. We have these amazing new vaccines. We have new treatments, huge advances over the last five years, but we all work and live in the real world. And the real world has more challenges. And one of those challenges are 
massive equity issues. So this is just one example. This is um, life expectancy by zip code in San Antonio, Texas. And for those of y'all who uh, don't know San Antonio well, this is San Antonio. This is the center of San Antonio. I am uh, right now, I'm at the medical center. So I'm up here in the sort of green to blue area. I live down here. Um, the life expectancy difference between the north side of San Antonio and the south side of San Antonio, as you can sort of see in this graph, is um, over 10 years. That correlates very strongly with income. These are uh, data from the City of San Antonio's Equity Atlas, which is a very interesting dashboard that I would encourage you all, if anybody is interested in these issues, to, to look at. Um, this is higher income is lighter color, lower income is darker color. So there is a you know almost a line in San Antonio of high income versus low income. And that correlates with race ethnicity. So lighter um, little squares are um, zip codes with lower percentages of people of color and darker are higher percentages of people of color. And so what that means is that how COVID or flu or RSV plays out in one place is very different from another, even just in the city of San Antonio. If you look at a map of diabetes in San Antonio, the differential looks very similar. If you look at a map of asthma in San Antonio, and we all looked a lot of maps of COVID during the pandemic, and certainly one of the things we saw in San Antonio is higher rates of COVID in communities where there was less income and more communities of color. This also plays out globally. So if you live in a country that is not the United States or Western Europe, it is much less likely that you would even have access to a COVID vaccine. And I think one of the great challenges and things that many of us are working on is the fact that the issues of equity in terms of vaccine distribution globally are really profound. So what does that mean? That means that we work in a world where all these other things impact how people respond to the in three infectious pathogens that I just described. So things like misinformation, crowded living conditions put you at more risk for all three of these illnesses because you're, you're closer to more people, which increases your risk of infection. Poor access to healthcare, food insecurity. Malnutrition is a huge predictor of poor outcomes for all three of these illnesses. Delays in presentation, lack of transportation, Absence of sick leave has been a real issue throughout the COVID pandemic, because if you can't take off from work without losing funds, then why would you even test for COVID? Why wouldn't you just go to work if you could? There is a lot of mistrust in the healthcare system. Many people have competing priorities and homelessness is a real challenge. Many cities during COVID had deals with local hotels and motels so that they could take folks out of group homes and put them in a place so that they could isolate. This is a, a picture that is both heartbreaking but very invocative that was taken by William Luther in the San Antonio Express News in 2020. It was then picked up by the New York Times and we made like the front page of many, many uh, newspapers around the country of lines outside of the San Antonio Food Bank when uh, everyone was out of work. So what does that mean for substance use disorders? So I think there are two things that intersect, and we're going to talk a little bit about intersectionality in terms of substance use disorders and viral illness. The first is that people with active substance use disorder across the board often have a combination of things. So nutritional deficits are very common. Compromised lung function, particularly if the substance you are using is an inhaled substance, or if you're using an opioid or other um, respiratory depressant, you also have compromised lung function. And then many substances, including you know everything from alcohol to cocaine, work as direct immune modulators. So many people who use substances are having a at least relative immunocompromise. 
which for all three of the viruses that I talk about, puts you at higher risk. There are also really important structural determinants of care for this, these communities. So crowded and unstable housing, food insecurity, delays in access to care, uh, lack of transportation and mistrust and misinformation are all real challenges. And there is very little data actually on the intersection of these viral illnesses and substance use disorder. RSV, I would really, in, I'm interested if anybody can find information on this, but I could find very few studies on the intersection of RSV and substance use disorder. Influenza, we know and have known for some time that substance use disorder is associated with an increased risk of ICU and mechanical ventilation. Alcohol use disorder has been a long, no, long time known risk factor for severe influenza. And for COVID, there is a lot of literature. My PubMed search had 1,823 results, but a lot of it is anecdotal. And we are only just beginning to understand what it looks like is that yes, substance use disorder is associated with an increased risk of hospitalization, mechanical ventilation, mortality for COVID in some studies, but not in others, notably. And it also appears to be uh, associated with an increased reinfection risk. So um, one cannot talk about this without doing the flip side. So COVID also interacts with substance use disorder as putting people at risk for substance use disorder. So our several years of isolation, disruptions in systems of care where many treatment centers for substance use disorder were shut down, an economic collapse and many other structural factors have led to an absolutely tragic increase in the already increasing challenges and epidemic of substance use disorder in our country. So I just wanna recognize, I realize this has been a very virus focused talk, but it goes the other way too. And as someone who was very out front talking about ways to protect yourself for COVID early on in the pandemic, I feel like I personally and all of us could have done a better job of figuring out that also there were real risks of isolation and disruption. So take home messages are know your epidemics. You all hopefully now know where to look for data and how to find where uh, these trends are visible in your own community. Effective prevention exists for all of these vaccines uh, and the monoclonal antibody even for RSV. Please encourage people to use them. We can be advocates for this. Treatment is underutilized, particularly for marginalized populations. So think about the treatments that we have available, especially for flu and COVID, not so much for RSV, unfortunately. And the intersection of viral illness and substance use disorder is really important and is understudied in RSV. And we really do need more data. So with that, I will stop and I'm happy to take more questions. And so often Jackson asks, what is the name of the antibiotic that can be purchased for kid against RSV? That is a great question. So the name, it's a monoclonal antibody and it has to be given, it has to be given in a healthcare setting. You can't, it's a, it's an injection. So it has to be given in a healthcare setting and it's called Nircevimab and the brand name is called Bayfortis. As far as vitamins for immune support, we get asked this question a lot. And as I, I mentioned, sort of poor nutrition as a predictor of severe, more severe illness, that applies for COVID and for flu and for RSV. And the real answer is there's no perfect vitamin. The best nutrition is through food and through a healthy diet. There are some data that zinc can be helpful for flu and for COVID. And so some people take zinc. I will warn you that if you take the uh, amount of zinc that has been shown to be potentially helpful in studies, it is associated with GI distress and diarrhea, uh, which I didn't tell a patient of mine once and, and heard about it, but zinc has been used in some studies. Other questions? So I'm looking at the Q&A. 
Um, and I don't see any additional questions. But I'll wait and see if anybody wants to ask. In the meantime, as people are typing questions, I just want to thank you all for your participation and your interest. I'm really grateful that um, there is a space in our community and in South, in Texas in general to talk about the intersection of infections and substance use disorder, and really honored to kick off this, this series about something that's so important. And to answer Juan Vare, to answer your question, yes, I think um, I think that they are going to distribute the the slides, so you should have access, and that means you'll have access to the websites, which are um, which are uh, really helpful and are updated a lot more rapidly than sometimes I can even uh, keep up. Thanks, Afa. <laughs> All right, I will go ahead and share our um, closing announcements, Andrea, and uh, I'll let you take that away. Sure, I'm just trying to activate my video feature here. It's not letting me. <laughs> That's why I haven't stepped in. No problem. All right, so thank you, Dr. Taylor. This was an incredibly informative didactics. The good news is we plan on sending this didactics to our learners so you guys can keep the didactic material and review it later. We want to also go through some announcements if we can post our announcements just to remind our learners about our next session. Okay, so when I see the announcements, uh, we'll start announcing. But for now, I just want to thank everybody for your participation in this first session of this incredible webinar. Like I said, there are seven other sessions coming. Each one, in each one of them, we're going to be analyzing COVID-19 and substance use disorder from different perspectives. Uh, let me remind all of our participants that we are offering in this session CMEs and CEs. And all you have to do is text the code 1009-5345 to the number that you see on screen and you will automatically receive your CME. If you're applying for CEUs, those specifically directed for those in the behavioral health professions, you can do that also just by completing the post-session survey. We are dropping in the chat right now. And also, we will send that same post-session survey after this class. So you all can tell us which one of our CMEs or CEs you would like to receive. And if we go to the next slide, reminder, we still have from the Texas Substance Use Symposium. Thank God we still have some openings. Uh, for virtual registrations. So you still can join us virtually. Any of our virtual classes uh, are available still for any of you. You can go to texasdexus.org and find more information. Remember, there are complimentary CEUs in any of these classes. And let me tell you, it's going to be a great opportunity for all of you to learn from and mingle from the real experts on substance use disorders. Great experience, I would recommend it. Next slide. And the next session is going to be on February 21st. We have Dr. Okafor presenting on stigma, COVID-19, and their impact on substance use and overdose. Very important perspective. We're talking about this overall topic in the uh, webinar. Uh, again, we wait for all of you there and 
thank you. Thank you for the great reception and participation. We're very happy to be here with all of you. We'll see you next month. Thank you all. And again, thank you, Dr. Barbara Taylor. Bye.